What's going on everybody? Miata Dad here, and as you guys know, I recently bought another Miata Project Too Soon Junior. If you guys missed the introduction to this project, I'll go ahead and link that video down in the description. Today we're going to get a little more acquainted with this new Miata. Now you guys already know how to buy a used Miata. I mean, almost 700,000 people have seen that video. But today I'm going to talk about what to do after you buy a used Miata. I mean, you just get this thing home in your driveway. It might be your first car, it might be your first Miata, and you're like, uh, okay, now what? Do I, does it need maintenance? Can I mod it right away? Do I have to feed it? So that's the topic of today's video. My name is Greg Peters, and you are watching Car Passion. So I've got a pretty simple three-stage process for every Miata that I buy. Now, yes, some of the things I'm going to list here, obviously, you are going to check out before you buy the car, but I'm going to include them anyways because they're important. The first thing is what I call the death check. I'm going to look over the car for the most important things, anything that could cause the car to blow up, fall apart, or kill me. And then once I see that everything is sorted in that department, I'm not going to worry about all the little details. I'm going to take the car out and absolutely shred it because I want to try to expose any weak points that this car has right up front so I can, you know, find them and address them. And then after that, after you drive the car really hard and after you drive it for a couple of weeks, you're going to discover a lot of its little quirks and issues that you might not have been able to find during the initial check before you bought it. And particularly with a car like this, I bought this car for $2,500. It's a salvage title. It's been crashed. It's got almost 160,000 miles. So during the check before I buy it, I'm not going through with a fine tooth comb and listing off every little teeny tiny thing I can find. I know the car's gonna have issues, uh, but that's part of the fun for me because I enjoy working on these cars. I enjoy making content for you guys. And uh, yeah, it's just gonna be a good experience. So without further ado, let's get to the death check. Number one, tires. Tires are the only thing that, t well, they're supposed to be the only thing that touches the road. And that could change based on how low you are. Tires are the thing that keep your car on the road. If there is metal hanging out of the tires, then it is not ready for, uh, we'll call it the car passion initiation. As long as there's a little bit of tread on the tires, you're fine. Also, good idea to check your pressures. Next thing, make sure that the brake fluid in the reservoir is not so low that it's going to uh, cause air to go into the system when you're rounding a corner that with a cliff on the other side, okay? That one should be pretty obvious, but I'm throwing it in there anyways. Next is brake pads. Now you can check how much brake pad is left without even taking the wheels off the car simply by looking into the brake pad like this. Now, obviously without taking the wheel off, it is hard to see that inside brake pad, but as long as the outside brake pad has a decent amount of life left, you can count on the inside one being okay. Now, you want to replace your brake pads once they get down to about five millimeters of pad left. As long as they have some meat on them, you'll be okay. Now, that doesn't mean you should be doing 100 mile per hour pulls in the canyons because stock brakes are stock brakes. This thing might have AutoZone pads on it, I have no idea. And I don't really want to test that fade limit until I know that the brakes are much more sorted. But as long as there's some pad on there, you're, you know it's safe to drive. Make sure the coolant level is good. And when you're running the car hard for the first time, even if the coolant level's good, you always want to keep an eye on that temperature. This car is new to you. You don't know if it's going to overheat. Maybe Maybe it didn't overheat on the drive home, but once you take it for a good rip, it might show otherwise. When you drive it on the freeway for the first time, you're going to notice, you know, give it a little swerve test. You'll hear if there's any excessive suspension clunking or any excessive play in the steering wheel. That could be a sign of something where you don't really want to push the car yet. You want to address that right away. Make sure that the oil level is good in the engine. You want it to be at the full line, especially if you're gonna go on a rip, you're hitting the corners, you're pulling as many Gs as these all seasons. I'm pretty sure the car has four different tires on it, but that doesn't matter right now. What matters is the oil is gonna be sloshing around in the pan on that hard drive. You wanna make sure that there is enough oil in there so you're not starving it. And the last thing really is you don't want there to be any puddles underneath the car, which would indicate a significant leak of possibly power steering fluid or oil or water. You probably would have noticed that before you bought the car, but maybe not. Little oil leaks are fine. These cars are now 20 to 30 years old. Pretty much every Miata you are going to go look at 
is gonna have some kind of leaking somewhere. So that's not that big of a deal, as long as it's not pouring out to where the next time you drive it, it's gonna run out of oil or something. Pretty much as long as those main things are checked, you're good to take the car out for a rip. So let's take a look at the outside of Old Too Soon here and see what we can notice. Now, as I said, the car is a salvage title and um, <clears throat> it's got a little bit of a crazy eye, okay? But that that's all right, it, it adds character. And the headlights are pretty yellow, so I'm thinking about restoring those. I got a lot of comments about doing possibly an NB2 for an end conversion or an MSM for an end conversion, so I'm thinking about that. The paint itself is actually pretty good in this one little spot that I just cleaned for the video. I swear I will wash the rest of the car later, right after I clean the wheels on my red car. But anyways, this paint is pretty new because it was repainted once all the bodywork was done. By bodywork, yes, I mean it is full of Bondo. So the only part that kind of sucks about that, I'm a little nervous to try to roll these fenders if I want to get real good wheel fitment, but We'll see how that goes, cross that bridge when I get to it. Now, I was thinking about getting this car either painted or wrapped just to, you know, kind of make it my own. But I don't know if I want to go that far yet. Tell me, in the, in the description, you guys tell me. Should I, do you like the green or should I get it painted? Around the back side, we got a little bit of an identity crisis going on. The good thing is I like the NB2 tails and I only have to buy one of them. Wheels, it does have the 15 inch sport wheels. I don't know if this car is a sport model or if someone just added those. I'm not that familiar with the NB stuff, okay? More importantly, the tires. Ventus V12 Evo. Yeah, I'm pretty pumped on that. Let's check out the condition of the other, uh, oh. All right, so we got a Nexon CP641, interesting. A Ventus S1 Evo, okay, that's three different tires. Ah, uh, should have known. This one's gotta be my favorite, the Cormoran Gamma B2. I haven't heard of that one before. I'm sure the traction is just excellent on this thing. The only other thing I really noticed straight away is how much wind noise this car has compared to my other car. And I think it's mostly due to the soft top gap. I think most of that might just be a latch adjustment. I haven't messed with them yet. Hopefully the car's not so crooked that the top can't line up. Thinking about doing a hard top as well. Honestly, I do not like soft tops. But that's enough about the outside. Let's jump into this thing. It's got one of those cool aircraft looking chrome gas doors that uh, doesn't open. <laughs> Content security is what that is, boys. I'm gonna do a how to make your gas door open video. Welcome to the cockpit of Project Too Soon, Junior. The first thing you'll notice here are these beautiful NB2 replica gauge faces, which I think someone just printed off at their Kyocera industrial copier at work. They're actually made out of paper and curling back into the cluster. They actually don't look that bad during the daytime, but at night, this looks like some sort of alien spacecraft. You can see the skeleton of the cluster through the faces because they're so thin. I sent a picture of these to Adam at Revlimiter, and um, he blocked me. So I, I don't know if this thing's, I don't know, I'm just kidding. This, of course, this thing's getting Revlimiter gauge faces. This obviously is another pretty common problem. Not only is the upper boot torn, but the lower boot is torn, you can't see it from here. You can tell when the lower boot is torn because it will just be blowing hot air through that hole, especially when there's a hole in the upper shift boot, it's like a little miniature heater just blowing through there. And if your engine has any oil leaks, transmission fluid leaks, you are going to smell all of that vapor just wafting into the cabin. This is another question I get a lot. People say, oh, my transmission's really noisy. I can hear like whirring and bearing noises and stuff. A lot of times it's just because your lower boot is torn and it's letting all the noise through that your transmission normally makes makes anyways that you wouldn't otherwise hear. So once you do a shift or rebuild kit, you won't hear those noises and you won't be uh, huffing all that vapor coming through that hole right there. And that's pretty much it for the inside. I mean, it's basically an all stock NB in here other than what I've shown you. It has an aftermarket deck, a Nardi wheel. I don't know if that's factory or not. So let's get on to some of the more mechanical and functional things, uh, you know, the juicy stuff. Let's go ahead and start with this passenger window. And that's about all I get. So obviously this thing needs a window regulator. Go ahead and roll it back up now. 
please, 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 please. Oh, thank you. Okay, almost everything else works. It's got AC, it's got power steering. The only other thing I found, which I'm not gonna lie, this was almost a deal breaker. Watch this. When you turn the headlights on, Here, let me show you a little bit closer. Isn't like, there, nothing comes up. It's supposed to come up. Honestly, I've never even seen this before. Maybe someone could drop this in the comments. I, I have not been able to get them to come up yet and I have no idea. Maybe it's just a fuse or something. Oh, and of course, All right, let's take a look under the hood. See what we find. Ah yes, the heart of the beast. Run of the mill BP4W, a lot of people's favorite Miata engine out of all the NAs and NBs, and for good reason. I mean, the thing's just great. Look how beautiful it is. And this is actually about 99% stock, except for my favorite intake ever on naturally aspirated Miatas, the racing beat intake. I love the induction noise you can hear after you install that intake. But now that I've driven it for a while and driven it hard, let's take a little bit of a deeper dive and check out some of its issues. I'll start with the cooling system, specifically this cap, which I don't think is a factory cap, but at any rate, it is leaking pretty much everywhere it could possibly be leaking. There's a chance the radiator neck is cracked or that might just be coming from the cap itself. I'll have to clean that off after I replace the cap and look into that. Now that begs the question, how has the rest of the cooling system been maintained? Upon close inspection, there is a good amount of coolant residue right around the edge of the hose and even down below, like it could have been dripping a little bit. That means that you have to do this hose. If it's seeping like that, it is um, possible days away from bursting. Coolant hose down connected to the motor, same thing, it's got a little bit of coolant residue, the heater core pipes, everything. Either someone replaced the hoses and didn't clean any of the residue off, or this thing needs a cooling system refresh, which is what I'm leaning towards, and definitely what I'm doing. Come have a seat with the old Miata dad, and let me give you guys a little pro tip. The cooling system of your car is probably the most likely thing to leave you stranded somewhere. And it's also one of the least expensive and easiest to fix parts on the entire engine. So if your coolant hoses are looking sketchy, please just replace them. You're eliminating like 50% of the cause why people break down in the middle of nowhere. Why would you take that risk? The whole cooling system in this car is only a few hundred dollars, but that's one of the first things I'm doing to this car because I noticed the hoses just look old and I don't want to get stranded. This car has 160,000 miles on it. Miatas are supposed to have a timing belt at 60,000, 120,000, and 180,000. Looking at those cooling hoses, something tells me those were not done at 120. Something tells me they're probably older than that, which makes me question the health of the timing belt. That probably wasn't done at 120 either. And if you're picking a Miata up, especially if you intend to keep it for a while, just do a timing belt service. If you the history on this car is unknown. I have no idea what maintenance has been done to it. Timing belt kit is not that expensive. I'm doing the cooling system, which involves a water pump. You have to change the water pump when you do a timing belt anyway, so it's just kind of part of the whole deal. Now, when I start this car up in the morning, I smell fuel, and that's bad because fuel can equal fire. Where the leak is probably coming from is one of the fuel lines, which may very well be from 1999, and I don't want to rely on 21-year-old rubber to keep over 40 PSI of fuel inside this system. So I'm just gonna go ahead and replace all the fuel lines along with one of the most forgotten about maintenance items that ever existed, the fuel filter. If you guys have never changed the fuel filter on your car, go change it. They're like 10 to $20 and they take 10 minutes to change. If you don't know how to do it, just give me a couple of videos and I'll teach you how. A clogged fuel filter can lead to power loss, hesitation, and getting debris into the injectors. Now, speaking of hesitation, this car does have a hesitation. I notice it mostly on the freeway under very light throttle, maybe cruising uphill, a little on and off power, and I'm suspecting it probably just needs a set of spark plugs and wires, which is another extremely common maintenance item. Miata engines are pretty sensitive to having bad plugs and wires, another thing that's not very expensive. And if you haven't done it in a long time, it's not a bad idea to do it. And considering I'm going to be spraying a load of nitrous into this thing, I wanna make sure the ignition system is 100% on par because uh, yeah, I wanna make as much power as possible. Obviously. Another thing that literally stinks about this car is the exhaust leak that it has. 
So it's obviously not a big deal for performance, but you are gonna be smelling those fumes inside the car if you have a big enough exhaust leak. And I personally hate the sound of exhaust leaks. I think it makes all cars just sound like complete rattle traps, but luckily it's gonna be an easy fix. It's either a manifold gasket, or one of the gaskets in the exhaust system. The only other thing I noticed that may be somewhat of an issue is if the car is idling for a while with the AC on, it will start to run hot. And that's another very common issue with Miatas. I'm hoping with the cooling system refresh, I'll get that all sorted out, but I'll have to cross that bridge when I get to it if the problem persists. So those are pretty much all the items I'm gonna be addressing on this car before we can get into the fun stuff. So over the next few videos, I'll be showing you guys how to do some of those things that I talked about. If you did learn something in this video, don't forget to smash like, subscribe if you are new, subscribe if you're pumped for Too Soon Junior, and I will see you in the next one. Peace out. What's going on everybody? This is Bree Manley with the Cart Passion Channel and I'd like to introduce my new project today. This uh, specifically is a Vons cart. It's really the preferred model as uh, it's got various upgrades over both Ralph's and Albertson's. 